Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. I am uh, Cristina Dumitrescu, Senior Investment Manager at the Inclusive Finance Team at European Investment Fund. And I have the honor and the privilege to moderate today a panel on accelerating financial inclusion for women in Europe, lessons learned from emerging markets. Big thank you to start with to EMFP for including this hot topic into the events organized uh, in the framework of the European Microfinance Week in 2022. And we are also welcoming our online audience to this, uh, to this panel. Um, at its most basic level, financial inclusion starts by having a simple bank account. 2021 Global Findex show a bit of improvements in this area in the emerging markets. The latest report indicates that the gender gap decreased in the last few years and additional 250 million women uh, from developing countries have got some access to financial services. In Europe, the population with bank accounts continue to grow. However, in various countries, the women a large proportion of the female population are still left behind the banking uh, sector. If we speak about internet banking and other digital tools, which we all know that facilitate financial inclusion, especially in emerging markets, and the experience there is overwhelming sometimes, the picture is more or less similar. So there is meaningful progress in the area. However, unequal access to technology um, brings the risks of longer term exclusions. GSMA data on smartphone ownership show a an widening gender gap. If we spoke about 15% in 2021, 2022 already shows an 18% gender gap in this area. And if we look into the entrepreneurial dimension, and we all know that entrepreneurship is male-oriented, um, we see the newly created businesses by women are slowly increasing. But in 2022, female entrepreneurs represented only one-third of the European entrepreneurs. And if we look on various research speaking about the credit gender gap, we see that women-led businesses are often rejected when they apply for a business finance. I've seen the other day um, a report that women-led businesses received only 1% one, one, one of the uh, venture capital private equity investments realized in 2021. So we are discussing all these topics and we encourage you to participate in the, in the discussion with um, an exceptional panel, I would, I would say. And I would start with Mary, Ali, Mary Ellen Iskanderian, President and CEO of Women's World Banking, a passionate advocate for women's economic empowerment through greater access to finance, a leading voice for women's leadership in financial services. In her recently published book, There is Nothing Micro About a Billion Women Making Finance Work for Women, Mary Ellen illustrates through various personal stories of women in emerging markets how transformative effect has financial inclusion on women, their families, their businesses, their, the communities these women are living in. Katarzyna Hanula Bobit, Senior Financial Inclusion Lead at Microfinance Center, one of the microfinance networks in, in Europe. Uh, she was a European Commission expert advising on the reviews of the European ACIS from a social perspective. She stays currently in the board of Financial Inclusion Europe. Anne Quinn Goli, Communication Manager at Microlux. Microlux is a microfinance institution in, in Luxembourg, and she will share with us a microfinance provider perspective 
uh, on the um, financial inclusion of women. And last but not least, Dr. Anastasia Kozarenko, Associate Professor at, um, of Economics at Montpellier Business School, with extensive research in the area of social finance and microfinance, with special attention to uh, regulation, non-financial services, subsidization, discrimination, and gender, from both theoretical and empirical perspectives. And I will start with you, Anastasia. Anastasia, sorry. <laughs> um, What's the, the level of financial inclusion or exclusion in, in Europe? Can we measure that? Yes, that's a very good question, uh, Christina. First of all, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being here. I'm delighted to be part of this session with all the participants. And uh, concerning the question, so as you mentioned, indeed what we see in the developing economies using the FINDEX data set, the World Bank data set measuring the financial inclusion, is that in terms of access to a banking account, the gap between men and women indeed is getting lower and lower uh, with, with different waves. So that's good news. <laughs> uh, however, there are different dimensions of financial inclusion. So uh, we can go beyond access to a bank account and measure access to credit, access to formal savings, and even resilience, How to, uh, w whether you are able to get some emergency funds within a month, within a week, and so on and so far. So uh, what we have in Europe, so first uh, of all, in Europe, uh, we have no uh, real issues when we look on average in terms of access to a bank account. Because normally in Europe, banks uh, are supposed to open a basic bank account for anyone who is resident in Europe. Uh, okay, this is what happens in theory, of course, and for a small anecdote, when I'm originally from the Republic of Moldova, when I arrived in France for my studies in 2005, uh, I, I just entered the bank, which I, uh, I found, the first one I found uh, down the street, and they refused me to open a bank account, saying that, well, you're a student, you don't have a permanent residence, so why would we open you a bank account? And the next day, I go to another bank, a competing one, and they opened a bank account without any pro problem because they had a special service for foreign students there. So we have theory and practice, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, okay, but if you go, uh, if you look at the averages, indeed, uh, we don't have uh, a significant gap in terms of access to a bank account, except uh, three countries in Europe, Lithuania, Romania, and Portugal, where the gap is higher than 5% between men and women. So now I'm going uh, deeper in terms of financial inclusion and talk about access to credit. And here is where the real gaps emerge. Interestingly, we don't see these gaps in the developing economies or in, uh, in the US, for instance, because the access to credit is difficult for everyone in, um, in developing economies. In the US, the gap is rather between the richest and the poorest people. But the gender gap is really something very specific to Europe. This is what we find with my co-author, Ariane Zafartz, uh, using the Findex data set. But by the way, we were very surprised that in the Findex report, they look at the gender gaps, but only in terms of access to a bank account. They don't look at gender gaps in terms of access to a credit, formal credit institution or formal savings. And we were, okay, let's, let's go for it, let's, let's have a look. And we found significant gender gaps in terms of uh, access to formal bank, banking institution uh, and access to formal savings. Uh, in, almost, uh, in most of the European countries, we have gaps uh, larger than 5% in terms of access to a formal bank uh, formal banking, credit, uh, and uh, savings. So, uh, and just to go maybe a bit further, so uh, in terms of these discrepancies, we have the supply side and the demand side. So it ca can come on one hand from banks, and we do have literature which finds in indeed that women are um, more often to be rejected when they ask a credit, but beyond rejection, there are also credit terms. And the literature finds that uh, women are charged in general higher interest rates. They are more often asked to pledge collateral when they are asking for a credit, and also they receive smaller loans. At the same time, they also create smaller projects, so uh, it might come from their, uh, their um, demand for loans. So 
And just to mention a study that we also have in terms of uh, access to microfinance in Europe, so we use French microfinance institution data, where we look at the intersectionality, so it, it was a topic mentioned at the, the previous uh, session, uh, so we look at uh, the access uh, to credit uh, at the microfinance institution in France. Uh, we look at gender first, and we see that uh, women uh, are more likely to receive a credit from the microfinance institution, but at the same time, they are more likely to repay their credits. So uh, they are basically recompensated for the fact that they are less likely to default. But when we look closer to the intersectionality, meaning that we look at European women versus non-European women, we find that non-European women are more likely to get a credit from the microfinance institution. However, they default more often as compared to men. But European women, they are not more likely to get access to credit, but they repay better than men. So they are not, basically, they are not recompensated for their better credit worthiness. So what's interesting here is even within social finance, we do have, if you look closer, we can find some discrimination against uh, some segments of women. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Marie Ellen, do we see the same picture in emerging markets? Or there is something different there? And what's that um, peculiarity on, on the emerging markets? Um, so first of all, this is fascinating because it really is a, a very, very different Thank world you. than the one that I'm, um, I kind of find myself swimming in most of the time, which is that world of the FINDEX where financial inclusion is perhaps far too narrowly defined as that access to a bank account and where women are still really fighting that, that battle, that, that very basic access. Um, at women's world banking, and I, I think pretty broadly across the industry, we no longer think of financial inclusion as really just mm. opening a bank account. In fact, the level of dormancies that we see um, once those bank accounts are, are opened, um, indeed women are a third more likely to have bank accounts that they don't even use, that are not, not active, would indicate that those clients don't really feel included in a system where all they have is that, that basic access. Um, we then start to see the, the, the nuances or similar nuances, access to savings, access to credit, um, are, there's, there's quite a significant differential. I'd say two very big drivers though that I'll, I'll just t you know, touch on, on briefly is really, uh, at least for the last decade or a little bit longer, the access to digital financial services, access to the, the mobile phone and the ability to transact um, through, through digital technology has really become the way one is included in the formal financial system. And so, as you yourself referenced, there is still that, that basic technology gap. I'd love to hear some of the similar numbers here. My understanding, though, is there's much greater level of parity in terms of internet-enabled cell phone ownership in, in Europe than there is um, in the emerging markets. So that is that basic gateway the ownership of the phone and the confidence to use it and to navigate it is a much bigger deal in, in the emerging markets. And the more we digitize financial services, the more that really becomes the main avenue for um, inclusion, the more urgent it is really to, um, you know, to, to, close, to close that gap. I think the other big driver or the big big factor that, again, I, I don't have quite the sense that it, of how it, it, it played out in, uh, in, in Europe, but um, the COVID uh, crisis, probably financial inclusion in the emerging markets was one of the only places where we might have had a bit of a silver lining because 193 countries had COVID relief payment programs where they, they sent payments directly to um, their most vulnerable populations. Most of those programs were in some way digitized. So again, they really um, accelerated the access to the technology, uses of, of technology. And in, in several countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, immediately come to mind, we were able to take care, to take 
take advantage, if you will, of the crisis to sort of burst through some gender norms that had prohibited um, cell phone ownership by women and girls uh, previously, so we've really seen those gender gaps fall. Um, I think the challenge for us in the emerging markets, though, now that we've brought literally a quarter of a billion people now have access as a result of government to, to person payments made during COVID, now that we have them in the formal system, how do we keep them there? How do we make products relevant, um, understandable, affordable, um, and that's where I think we may have some interesting conversations between the emerging markets and Europe. Thank you very, very much. Coming back to, to Europe and, and to Kasha, um, we know that Microfinance Center has a real deep involvement in European microfinance market, but also Central Asia. What are your members, the microfinance providers, uh, think about it? How do they see women as a beneficiaries of their, of their products? Yes, thank you for that question. And it's really difficult to say something new and innovative after uh, three days of talking about <laughs> women and financial <laughs> inclusion and all the data. And, and, and then I was asked to give you some numbers, so it's always super exciting, of course, to give people numbers after the two and a half uh, great days. So, uh, no, but thank you for that question, right? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, our members as the microfinancers are very diverse. You can have a very big... Uh, organizations uh, who are already banks uh, and then we have a small NGO so there is also not it's it's whoever you want to see in the microfinance space you probably can can find so uh, from the survey that we are doing together with the uh, the European microfinance network uh, the, the the results was that the, uh, the women are constituting for 43 percent of borrowers we can say good bad I don't know with the access to finance and the basic bank accounts in in the in Europe I think it's, it's, it's okay. The most clients, which is interesting, I think, are women clients are in the cooperatives, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is something that, that we can also consider why women are more tend to go to the cooperatives rather than to any form of, uh, of financial uh, institutions. I think a lot is also linked to uh, that um, in, the, in general, the microfinance sector employs a lot of women. It's 63% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of... Uh, of the total employees are women, and they're on different positions. I don't have the break-ins, but we know that there are C, uh, the female uh, CEOs, there are female agents, and that also is something that, that we learned during this conversation here that we had during those days, that it sometimes is an enabling factor to, to have to, to, to increase uh, the uh, number of, of women that are using the, the financial services. The digitalization is kind of an interesting uh, aspect for us. Because we also run this uh, survey among our members and on their clients, like if we roughly take 800 something clients, people said, I'm feeling okay with digital, but okay could be, yes, I saw a mobile phone and I have few apps, or I'm very technically uh, you know, engaged and, and I can use it. So I think there's a need to be more work done in this area because we know that uh, Europe is great with regulation, and we're really good with a big statement. So, you know, gender is the fundamental human rights. We have an invest EU with the gender lens, and we can really go through, through all those wonderful statements that are there, like how, how equal we are and how gender is relevant. But then, actually, it's, there is something in the detail that is missing. So I think that's, maybe I stop here and can go more into discussion, but I think, yeah, this is, is what I would like to your comment on, on the internet and digital tools reminds me about um, um, a working paper that EF will, will be publishing um, before the end of the year, where it's shown that the Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, their internet banking is basically everywhere, and there are even more women using internet banking in those countries than men. However, if we go to the Southeast Europe, Romania, Bulgaria, there the internet banking usage is so low that you cannot really differentiate between men and women because there is a low usage anyway. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. Kuyen, Microlux is the microfinance institution in, in Luxembourg. And as you mentioned earlier, it's the um, 
latest microfinance institution established in, in Europe. And um, let's be honest, we are in Luxembourg, yeah, well-developed country from an economic point of view with a strong financial sector. Still, we have a microfinance institution targeting non-bankables. How do you see the, um, the aspirations of a women entrepreneur, of a woman entrepreneur? Why is, would she prefer to come to you rather to go to, to a bank? having me here today with uh, the, this great panel and especially for the opportunity to talk about our work in here in Luxembourg. As you mentioned, Christina, um, Luxembourg uh, took time to, to have the, his own microfinance institution um, because I think uh, I, was, I wasn't there in the, the creation of my colleagues, but how, what I've been, uh, I've, have heard is that we, we thought that Luxembourg with a well, very well established financial center, um, every, everyone is covered. But uh, we came to a conclusion that is not uh, the reality. So um, it's been like six years now that Microlux is operational. And uh, from years to years, we uh, can confirm this trend, this, this, uh, this trend that um, less and less people have uh, access to credit bank for their um, entrepreneurship uh, project. So here in Luxembourg, what we, we see is not really um, a gender gap in, in, in terms of access to, to banking services. It's more like um, an exclusion um, in general to a business starter, business creator, um, especially after the pandemic, uh, some of the sector they don't even need to try the bank uh, because they know that they will not, you know, like cross the entry of the bank. Um, in, for example, um, Horeca, that's as we said, uh, the, the restoration sector, the banks don't want to hear about it anymore because they was closed most of the time, most of the pandemic. And um, so, so the women, for, for what we have seen in our experience uh, at my colleagues, um, the, the, the gap that we can see is not um, in the, the banking level, but it's more like in, in terms of uh, their the personal situation. So um, when they, they, uh, they came to my colleagues, women tend to have a less, uh, um, you know, um, favorite financial situation. They had less income. And uh, most of the time, they always have children to, to take care of. When, uh, in terms of after a divorce, of uh, this kind of, of, uh, of a situation, so um, they don't need to go to the bank. We know already that they will not have the chance to get a, um, a bank loans for, for their business. And as mentioned before, uh, women tend to have smaller business uh, because they are they tend to, to be a little bit more cautious about and um, underrate a little bit their potential because the woman's self-esteem is well known that, you know, less, uh, lesser than, than, than men. So um, they, they came to us, they asked for a, um, a, a credit and they are happier afterward because the, the impact that we can see uh, from, from a woman's perspective is, um, uh, is, is higher because they came from a lesser situation. So it's this kind of thing that we want to um, insist on in terms of non-financial services, because uh, we want to, to um, reinforce their service team uh, to, the, to, to, to get them to be more um, emancipated from the situation before. So it's more, I think, this kind of, 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 um, of situation that we want to learn a bit more about microfinances in the, the southern, uh, because of course you have more experiences in this area too, uh, that can inspire a practitioner here in, in Europe. I'm so glad that you you touched the the non bank the non financial services offered to to micro entrepreneurs. Is there any? I don't know how to how to raise this question without, uh, and I, I do apologize for the question. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of education of the girls and women that they have lower self-esteem, that, that they underestimate their own potential. 
I, I don't know, it's just, uh, I, I apologize for it. It just crossed my mind. <laughs> Well, if, if you want answer to that, <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I, want, I, I think it's I think it's a real food for thought, because um, in in my opinion, women inclusion start from having equal chances with the men, and um, we know or I know that in Eastern countries our um, our mothers, our grandmothers, were raised in a different way that we today raise our our girls. Let's put it this way. Um, I, I'm just wondering if uh, we come from families like closure, you know, uh, context and atmosphere. That funny that you mentioned your your mother. Mm -hmm. I have my mother. So, oh, it's been more than 30 years that she lived in in Europe. And she still thinks that the, the good part for a girl is to go to school and then get a husband. And then after the husband is going to be a child, at least once, at least one, uh, if not ideal is two. And then she's always, she's, I, I, I remember at the beginning of our marriage, she always wants me to, to make coffee for my husband. <laughs> so, you know, it's come from that maybe. Yeah, yeah I think there's a lot... Um, in that, how, we, how the system works, and we can kind of think that system doesn't matter, but, but system does matter. So we have, to, we have to realize how the system was built, and if we want to correct the system, what would be, there's a very popular term right now that we have to look through gender lens right now, and I believe that it's more than just an empty term, that, that we really have to realize that there are some barriers that the women are facing because, you know, we are different than men, right? So, so we also think differently. We, we may have a different needs. It doesn't mean that we need a different product. It needs that we need kind of a different care. And so it's easier to, to, to under, women to understand women than to men to understand women. I'm married. I know a lot about that, right? So, it's <laughs> so I think this is also, if, we, if we're doing, and of course, education plays a very relevant role. And I think with microfinance, this, this is the interesting thing that we can take at time, right? So we take in the time. There is this, a lot of this uh, non-financial uh, services that are being provided, that, that there is this additional kind of TLC for the, for the customer who, to, to adapt, not only for a woman, for a man as well, for somebody who comes from the rural. rural so, but I think there is this additional space for, for that. Yeah, just to add on that, you don't have to be sorry for the question because the academic literature indeed finds that there is differences in self-esteem for women as compared to men. But also what you mentioned when the risk averseness and the fact that women are more uh, precautionary. So this is why their projects are smaller because they take less risk. But there is also something else coming with this. Um, uh, the, a very recent study published this year by uh, some colleagues of mine in banking find that when women get rejected uh, by a bank, they are less likely than men to apply uh, for a credit again. And this is reinforcing uh, itself because without undercapitalization can have very um, consequences on the long term in terms of the business growth. And some women don't want their, women, uh, their businesses to grow, men as well. But um, yeah, so it's kind of a circle which reinforces itself. But for the non-financial services, what I would like to mention is that uh, it's something very specific to Europe. In some countries, we even have the definition of microcredit, which includes the non-financial services inside. Because um, businesses created by micro-entrepreneurs in Europe are very different from the generating, income generating activities in the poorer countries. Uh, they have to be formalized, you have a lot of administrative burden to create them, and for all of this, uh, if it's the first time when you're starting a business, and, uh, business which, which is often the case for microfinance clients, you need some, uh, uh, some help uh, for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I, I just can't sit on, on just one point. I always get so anxious when I hear, you know, women are risk averse, women are more cautious. There's quite a bit of evidence actually that shows it's not so much a, a question of aversion to risk or overly cautious. I, I like to think of them as, you know, risk aware or risk efficient <laughs> because we see 
and, and admittedly, my, my research is primarily in the emerging market, so perhaps it is different in, in, um, in Europe. But we see time and time again that a woman entrepreneur will actually save for a longer period of time before she borrows. Now, she has good reason to do that because she is far less likely to get credit formally. She's far less likely to get friends and family money than a male entrepreneur is. So she has to save. So women's businesses tend to be started out of savings at a much greater rate than, than men's. But we found, like even in Bangladesh, where a lot of the very early um, microfinance models required a certain level of saving before borrowing was allowed, once women had reached a point of saving that they felt they could provide for their families, that the safety cushion was in, in place, the risk aversion was exactly the same as, as for men. So I, I just always think we need to caution ourselves a little bit about what is aversion and what is just maybe being an awareness of, of a risk level. I just felt like I had to say that. <laughs> I, I really think that women are more aware of the risks than the men are. Hmm. I, I, I really believe that. The yeah. readiness, because you said that they need to, to prepare more to get where the men get with m less time. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a matter of, of control as well. Because you remind me of my, my mom, who was, she's her whole life, she's an entrepreneur, and uh, she takes a lot of risks. It's not the same as, as our client here, who was ra raised more European way yeah. in the system that's very well established. And what they told you always, take care, you know, think about the risk. Everybody t tell you, oh, be aware of this, be aware of that. So we are raised like this here in Europe to be risk averse, you know. So what could we do, if we could do, of course, to facilitate the, to, to accelerate the financial inclusion of women. And I would start from the global perspective and then we go to the European perspective. No, and I'd, I'd love to throw some ideas out and see whether you think these, these <laughs> might work because they are things that, that we are starting to see um, bear fruit. Certainly um, something that I've heard a lot of discussion about over the last two and a half days, as, as you say, uh, is making sure that we're, we're um, not repeating ourselves over and over, is this idea of gender intentional design and really designing products that reflect everything that we just talked about, about women's different risk frontier, where women may have this sense of just not feeling welcome at all in the, in the bank. Maybe you know that 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 greater understanding of where the pain point is, and then designing specifically around that. So I that I feel has an applicability regardless of where where we're talking about women. But I I, I do come back to the digitization piece because I think it it plays itself out in a number of different ways that may have some really interesting implications here in Europe in the way that, that it certainly is in, in developing countries. Certainly, the, the data that is made available through digital financial services is establishing a whole new way of creating a credit history, creating um, alternative credit scoring models that are allowing financial service providers, if they do want to lend to women, to gain an understanding of data that they and, and the, the the capacity to pay, and frankly, because of some of the behavioral patterns that show up in data as well, the um, the willingness to pay as well. Um, you know, there's some very really interesting credit scoring models that are being developed, not just on you know, whether you top up your, um, your cell phone prescription, but are you the kind of person who does it just as the phone is about to go out? Or, or, or do you, are you topping up on a regular basis and making some behavioral conclusions um, uh, around, around that? I think um, we're also starting to see e-commerce really come into its own. It's, it, it, it suits women so well. They are so much more likely to want home-based businesses. And as we have you know, digital payment mechanisms, in, in the emerging markets, we see a problem that I'm guessing, and again, I'd love your thoughts, um, maybe less of an issue here, that 
sort of the quality and trust issues are such that an e-commerce business started by a woman in India has to have six in six transactions that are accurately the product is the product you ordered the payment is the payment you you thought you were going to get that has to happen you know completely correctly six times before um, someone will transact on a regular basis. It's five times in, in Indonesia. So I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe some of those quality control issues are, are a, bit, a bit less here. The other thing, just a, again, a, a study that we did with a bank in Vietnam that was, was really fascinating, um, and I, I think it really requires banks to take a deeper look at exactly who their client base is. Um, and this bank brought us in because they were having just outrageous customer turnover numbers in what they thought was their retail banking portfolio. And they were seeing much higher rates of turnover amongst their women, which is why they brought Women's World Banking in. So when we you know, started looking at, at who these accounts were, it turned out that a very significant portion of those that were turning over within one year of having opened the account were e-commerce sales, uh, women who were selling primarily on, on, on Facebook or through WhatsApp, on, on those kinds of platforms. And they were running you know, huge volumes through their account, but they were leaving because they needed so many other services that were business services. Now, some of the, you know, the blame, if you will, was on them for not disclosing that they were actually businesses. But the bank had no idea that these were not just retail customers that had a lot of turnover in their account and then they would close. And so I think it really spoke to, you know, when we spoke to the woman, what, women, what the other services they would have liked to have gotten from the bank. It was, you know, it was, it was quite a, a broad range. It would have been a very, you know, successful business line for the bank to have been considering. Um, and then just two quick things on, on fintech that I, I know there was a very uh, boisterous conversation yesterday on uh, fintech versus microfinance, but I, I do think there, there are some fintech models that might be particularly helpful here. Um, there is still a very high rate outside of the Nordics primarily, but in much of uh, the rest of Europe, there's still very high rate of cash transactions. And that is just leaving in a, you know, sort of a, an, a, an efficiency rate and a level of information about who's transacting just completely in the dark. And so we've seen some of the embedded finance models really lower the cost of customer ac acquisition and allowing you from the, you know, the very first day that you transact with a, um, a client to know so much more about their inventory patterns, their payment patterns, how well they are repaid by their, um, by their um, clients. So I, I think the, that embedded finance model that we're seeing in the fintech world could be very interesting. And then just very quickly, lastly, um, the, the P2P, the peer-to-peer -peer model, has been very successful for women in a lot of places. Um, some of the things that you mentioned, they are, aren't as penalized as, um, as men's companies are on, on the peer-to-peer -peer platform, which is, which is very, um, very exciting. And again, utilizes alternative uh, data and actual perf business performance for them to gain access to financing. So I don't know whether any of that sounds like it might fit in an, a European context, but those are some of the ways that we're, we're seeing women's entrepreneurship really start to, to flourish. Yeah, that's uh, these are interesting uh, ideas and actions that might work. I, indeed, I think that digital finance has and peer-to-peer -peer lending, all these actions are completely relevant for Europe. Um, what I could mention uh, in terms of from what I see from my, my own research, because I also work on microfinance in developing countries, is what we see is that uh, women in microfinance institutions, loan officers, or women on boards of microfinance institutions, they do mitigate trade-offs between social and financial performance. So this is a study, uh, we have two, two different studies on that. One is with Naomi Wittiti, I don't know if she's here today, but um, she's attending the conference, and with Samir Nyarko as well. So what we find is indeed uh, there are trade-offs uh, trade between uh, social performance and financial performance, and one of the social performance indicators is the percentage of female borrowers 
And we see that having more female micro, uh, loan officers or more female on boards indeed helps to have less trade-offs in those microfinance institutions. So this could be an idea that might be implemented in the European microfinance institutions. We do have some data in the survey, the European microfinance survey, in terms of the uh, female loan officers. But unfortunately, we don't have any data on the boards and how many female board members. Uh, something else uh, besides gender is also international members of the boards. This is also uh, another dimension of, uh, of the boards which mitigates the trade-offs between social and financial performance. So that will be uh, one idea for at the inst microfinance institution level and then on the government level because we do find indeed that there are um, different treatments uh, for female borrowers even within microfinance institutions is to, for the government to control uh, the sizes of the loans, the, in, uh, the interest rates, uh, the access to finance for women to make sure that there is uh, equality between uh, genders. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm conscious of the time. If there are any questions from the room, from the audience. Yes, please. Oh, the man is asking the first question. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I had a question already from the first minutes. I do not know how much um, the University of Montpellier is doing in all this microfinance, gender, so the, the elevator pitch, and also uh, microlux. Uh, how many people, clients do we have? How many millions? What's your role? Mm -hmm. Are you the coffee lady or the CEO? Or what, can you give an elevator pitch for the two organizations? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I can start. So yeah, all the research I was mentioning here is done by myself and we also have a chair in social and sustainable finance at Montpellier Business School. Sorry, it's not University of Montpellier, it's Montpellier Business School. <laughs> so, um, so we do a lot of work on microfinance and especially on gender. So the study I mentioned on the discrimination. Uh, and we also have uh, work on regulation, a lot of microfinance uh, sector. So, uh, for instance, what we find is that using data from a microfinance institution in France, we find that before being regulated, there was equal access in terms of the size of the loan for women, uh, women and men. But after regulation, the microfinance institution was working with the traditional bank. It was co-financing loans with the traditional bank. And this is where we started seeing a difference in terms of loan sizes. So when the microfinance institution works on itself, we don't see any differences, but when it cooperates with the bank, differences emerge. So uh, we interpret this as importing stereotypes from the banking industry. So this is just to give you another insight in terms of what we do in terms of gender and microfinance at Montpellier Business School. <laughs> Thank you for your question and your interest in, in our institution. Uh, Luxembourg, has, as we said before, just created in uh, 2016. So it's been only six years that we are uh, we in activities here in Luxembourg. We are a team of three persons, so very, very small one. So I'm uh, in charge mostly of communication, but uh, one of our mission is to uh, spread awareness about uh, the existence of microcredits as a tool to, for interactions, for, for financial inclusion in, in Luxembourg through uh, entrepreneurship. So um, actually, currently we have, um, actually we uh, funded uh, 100, more than 180 um, entrepreneurs. Uh, now we have 150, 150 active clients uh, with uh, overall disbursement of 3 million euro. Thank you. Thank you. One other question? Yes, please. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. My name is Lydia Balfewa from Opportunity International. Um, you mentioned one thing that really strike a call to me, and in terms of the barriers to access to finance for women in particular, one thing that you mentioned was collateral, uh, requirement for traditional collateral, and I was so happy that now we are looking into alternatives in terms of women's digital footprint, using it as a credit history. I just want to ask if there are any other, maybe case studies or things that are really working, because I know over and over, over the whole years, we've been talking about these things, the collateral requirement, and it's a big issue. 
I, I don't know about Europe, but at least in places that we work, it's a big issue for women. Are there any good examples in terms of what we can use as alternative collateral to convince the uh, financial service providers that uh, it is worth giving women the access to our credit that we are asking them for to, so they can use it to grow their businesses, but they don't necessarily have to go with the traditional collateral that we ask them for. Thank you. So uh, indeed we know that one of the main innovations of microfinance in developing countries is group lending. So this is one way uh, uh, to compensate for the lack of tr um, uh, physical collateral. So what we do in Europe, uh, some microfinance institutions tried group lending, but it didn't work as, uh, that well. So in some institutions they do have some group lending, but it's very marginal. So what uh, some microfinance institutions do is instead of having a group, they use a cosigner. They ask one of your family member um, who has some revenues to co-sign the loan for you to be responsible for, in general, 50% of the loan size. Um, and sometimes it can be not a family member or a friend, it can be some social partner, a church, or some social, um, some association which um, endorses the, uh, writes you a letter saying that, okay, this person is reliable, so you can trust her and you can, um, uh, lend to her. So this is one way to compensate for the lack of traditional collateral. This, the other way, you have in developing countries you have progressive lending. You start with a very small loan and then they increase um, uh, the second, the third loan, uh, step lending. In Europe, some institutions do progressive uh, loans, but it's not supposed to last for cycles for years. Uh, what the, a very good incentive is to graduate to a bank uh, to the banking system. So the idea of microfinance is, okay, here is your first loan, uh, you create a credit history, and then after this first loan, eventually a second loan, you can graduate to a banking system. So these are, I would say, the substitutes of traditional collateral in Europe. And if I may add here, sorry, Kuen, you wanted to add something. No, I, just, I want to give an example of, of what mm -hmm. Adnesia just said. In Luxembourg, we asked for one third, uh, a, a guarantor for one third of the amount uh, and actually we call it a solidarity uh, guarantee because it's not uh, money blocked on your bank account. It's just when, in case of the borrower doesn't honor the, the commitment, we then ask for the, the guarantor to, to pay in, instead of them, but only, again, just one third of the amount. And if I may add here on the collateral issue, in Europe we have various guarantee schemes, national guarantee schemes, uh, I know the case of, of France here, but also we have the international guarantee schemes, so-called uh, EU programs for, for microfinance. It was easy in the past. We have InvestEU uh, now, and these guarantees help the financial institution to lend money to more riskier borrowers or to m vulnerable groups. Naomi. <laughs> so, Noemi Radier from Incafin, former colleague of Christina. Good to see you. Um, I like to be a bit provocative as well. I haven't provoked my own panel, so I enjoyed it. Um, when I look at all the amazing women we had in all the panel over the last men and women, but we are talking about women. Uh, but when I look at all these amazing women, I don't see, I, I think we are a bit pass beyond the problem of self-esteem. I, I feel when we talk about self-esteem issue that we are trying to find excuse. I do believe, however, that um, we can build collective confidence for women through mentoring, networking. There are so many platforms of coaching that can help build the next generation of female leader. Uh, and I would like to know uh, within your organization, what are you uh, doing in order to build this new generation of female Leader or client. Thank you. Yeah. Just a very concrete example. In December, actually the 13th of December, we have a workshop about self-esteem, actually, in creating a Simpson. What this kind of workshop that we do regularly for, uh, you know, like a project, a business project, for the creator and our, you know, current uh, clients so they can help. And we always do that a little bit before Christmas. 
you know, to light up the mood a little bit and with the weather and everything. But yeah, that's the thing that we do a lot. And we, we actually, it's not uh, designed only for women, but uh, we can see that the participants are always, we have a majority of the participants are always women. I don't know if you have more things to add. I will just add on, on the EF side, we are organizing early December um, two days master class for women involved in private bank in um, private equity market in, in Europe. Nicole, you wanted to comment? Yeah, uh, I'm also not convinced about this self-esteem uh, issue. It, uh, I have the feeling that when a behavior is different in women and in men, we take this self-esteem, we bring the self-esteem issue. I, it's a bit of a joke, but I give you another reason why maybe a female is not uh, going, as is less likely to go back and ask for another loan. Because in the meanwhile, she is so much more creative than <laughs> how men are, that in the meanwhile, she has already found another solution, different that get uh, and be. Fair. I, I can add something. I think, um, like, I like to think about system because I'm right now uh, developing the, think, the system thinking. But if you look at what is the social protection that women need through their life. So we are giving birth to a children, right? So you would like to take some time off to kind of have the possibility to take care of your child, right? And I give you an example. So that's why we go to the more standard jobs. So like jobs that gives you the, the insurance, give you, uh, jobs that gives you time, paid time off, uh, and so on. And um, I talked to one of our uh, MFIs in Bulgaria. And she's like, we don't have problems with female entrepreneurs. We have a lot of female entrepreneurs because our social system is very good. Our social system has a good kindergarten that you can send your children. Our system is actually allow you to take time off and this is something that needs to be accounted in why women may go to more, are more uh, maybe cautious about what type of professions they are choosing. And if we can, and I think this is, this is the thing that we have to think, it's not only, oh, women are shy. If you have three children and the one of the child, children is sick, then you're going to be the primary caretaker of this child, at least until we have a complete balance and understanding from the, from the male side. But, but this is something that, that we should also look when we're thinking about why women are not entrepreneurs, how to create the system and the, the political will to actually make it more responsible towards, uh, towards female as the equal in, in it, right? Right. Yes, please, sorry. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Anna Elbert from the University of Agder. Um, you talked about in your app how uh, access to a bank account was not a good indicator of financial inclusion, and then we talked a lot about access to credit. But do you have any insights about other financial services, such as like insurance coverage or uh, pension schemes access, and or even like cryptocurrencies, like difference in uh, gender regarding those? That's a very good question. Um, no, I, what we have is some data on the resilience. So it's not exactly insurance, but if can you, how quickly you can get uh, access to some money in case of emergency. So uh, uh, you can, uh, there is access to this indicator and what we find is the gap is still there, but it's lower in Europe. Um, and in terms of the other services, uh, no, we don't really have studies on that, uh, at least as far as I know. Uh, what I know is that just uh, the regulation, uh, we have the Italian case with the regulation of microfinance industry, which um, creates many constraints for microfinance institutions where, where uh, they were less likely to create partnerships with uh, insurance companies to provide <laughs> microinsurance. But it's not really in terms of gender. So yeah, that's something which needs to be explored indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ah, Caravan, sorry. Maybe you have to close the panel. Maybe you're ready to close the panel. Yes, I, 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 I wanted to say that we are almost uh, to be kicked out from, from the room because the, the next panel is about to start. So I was preparing the, the, the closing remarks. Yeah. 
understand is that in Europe, women's entrepreneurship at the micro grant level is 45%. In emerging markets, Mary Ellen, it's where on average? 75%, 85%? I'm really sorry. Oh, okay. Next session will start in less than nine minutes, so sorry. No, no, we are, we are closing. We are cl closing. The one reason why that is, why is the difference, what is the difference, the one word, why is there such a huge difference? Is it, what is it? Culture, maybe. Yes. In one word, it would be very difficult to, to answer, I think. Because it's, I think it's more complex than that. So just one word with the time given to us. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe it's worth uh, organizing or thinking about having a dedicated um, conference on, on the topic of women inclusion. Why not? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you.